my name is Ronnie Chatterjee, and I'm a nerd, not a politician, so I'm not a very likely uh, candidate, but I decided to run in May 2019 for state treasurer. I wanted to put what I know to work for North Carolina. State treasurer has three main roles. First, he or she manages the $100 billion pension fund as a sole trustee. Two, you manage the state health plan for all of our state employees. My parents were both public employees where I grew up. Uh, the value they had from a defined benefit pension and being on the state health plan is what allowed us to have a middle-class life, allowed them to buy a house, allowed me and my sisters to go to college. And I want to protect those things in North Carolina, and I don't feel like they're being managed well today. The third piece of responsibility for the state treasurer is to manage our infrastructure. At a time America is going to need to rebuild after COVID, it's the time to go to the bond markets, looking at where the rates are. And North Carolina has grown a lot over the last 10 years, but we haven't kept up with our infrastructure investments. And so that's another key role for the state treasurer. I won the primary on March 3rd, although as you guys know, it seems like ages ago. I remember shaking hands and hugging people, and uh, we haven't done a physical event really since then. But uh, we won with 410,000 votes across the state. I became the first Asian American person ever nominated statewide by the Democrats. If I win, I'll be the first Asian American person and only a second person of color ever elected to the Council of State in North Carolina history. Uh, currently tied in the polls and have outraised the incumbent about two to one. And so I feel like we got a great chance on November 3rd, or whenever the results are in from the most important election in our lifetime. You know, we, spoke, we spoke with the uh, treasurer the other day, and uh, I asked him about some of your thoughts, and he was very dismissive of your qualifications for the job, but mm -hmm. he almost didn't want to die to answer some of them since you didn't have experience in the office or in government. And how do you answer that in terms of your government experience or elected office? You know, you're not a politician, not yet anyway, uh, or you might be, but you're not elected official yet. Uh, how do you respond to him when he's sort of this dismissive of your credentials and qualifications for the office? Well, you know, he's been in politics for 20 years. And I think the attitude that a lot of the folks in Raleigh right now have for the control is that anyone who has different ideas, anyone who offers a different perspective, um, they don't deserve to be part of the conversation. And that's going to end on November 3rd when I'm victorious. And I'll tell you why. One is I do have a lot of experience, more experience than he does making the kind of decisions that we need to make in North Carolina. I was a White House economist for President Obama on the heels of the greatest downturn since the Great Recession. Very similar to what we're going to have to do now. For President Obama, I worked to cut taxes for small businesses, make investments in infrastructure, get the economy going back again. That's what we need to do now. Governor Cooper put me on two commissions. One's called the Governor's Entrepreneurial Council. State treasurer makes lots of investments or potentially could in entrepreneurs and minority-owned businesses. That's what I've been advocating for in state government with Governor Cooper. I also serve on the board of NC First, which is overseeing a new transportation strategy for North Carolina, exactly where the state treasurer plays. I'm a person, by the way, though, who doesn't think I have all the answers. I think the current treasurer has quite an elitist attitude. It's one of the reasons why he chooses not to have a permanent chief investment officer. He doesn't like contradictory ideas. I would have an opposite approach. My education has made me more humble, not think I know everything, and I hire the best team to help me make the investments for North Carolina, starting with a permanent chief investment officer, a nonpartisan person who has experience managing money. That's the way the office should be set up. And the attitude the current treasurer has to people with different ideas and expertise is one of the reasons we're $3 billion short, by my count, in the state pension right now, and healthcare plan is a mess. He did take a lot of money out of the uh, stock market, didn't he? Wasn't that one of your points during the primary that we should be in the market more than we are? I mean, yeah, look, look at this. The investment policy, which the treasurer signed, I can send you a link to his website where it's included. It says we should have between 37 and 42% of our allocation in equities. We're way below that, according to the second quarter report. Why have we deviated from our investment policy? The first rule of investing is set a policy and execute it. So this isn't very complicated. There's no magic here. We're just way below where we should be in our allocation to equities. And we have been for a long time. What's that cost us? In 2017, the equity markets reached record highs. In 2019, the equity markets reached record highs. Since March of this year, the equity markets have reached record highs. That's cost us between, depending on the day, three to $4 billion. That's real money on a $100 billion pension, much more than any fee savings that he claims. And so I feel like the strategy has been bending over to pick up a nickel claiming credit, and then $20 falling out of your pocket every day. We can't afford it in North Carolina. And if he would have followed his own investment policy and had a chief investment officer, not rocket science, um, we would have been much, much better off. And I think the numbers show that. Peter, you have a question? I do. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for being with us. So, you know, the first question is about um, the, you talked about the tra traditional roles of the, of the um, treasurer 
And and you've also talked on in the campaign about being a little bit more proactive with what um, what the state invests in in terms of helping North Carolina businesses. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that because that's kind of a departure from what the the role that the treasurer uh, traditionally plays. Sure. I mean, look, we already have a great state auditor. We don't need a second one. We need someone in the state treasurer's office who's thinking about investing in North Carolina. And you're right, it hasn't really been a priority. One of the places we can do this in the treasurer's office is in our venture capital multiplier fund. This comes out of the Unclaimed Property Fund. It's a small allocation, but allows us to, to invest alongside venture capital investors in startups in North Carolina and around the country. This is a great way to create jobs uh, on, the, on the economic recovery that we hope to have after COVID-19. We know that small businesses, particularly new businesses, are the backbone of job creation in North Carolina and around the country. We should be investing in those businesses. I also think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that minority owned businesses have taken the biggest hit during COVID and their neighborhoods have been ones that have been, have been seeing the highest infection rates and also the biggest decline in businesses. Will we have a commitment with all the talk after the killing of George Floyd and racial reconciliation in this country? Will we actually have a commitment to invest in minority owned businesses? I think we should in North Carolina, given the kind of state we have and our diversity, which could be a strength. So those are two things we can do. The third thing is the treasurer is the chair of the state banking commission, but you don't hear them talking about it that much. We could do a lot more to increase capital, access to capital and credit for small businesses in North Carolina. So I think that's the backbone of how you build a good economy. North Carolina should be on offense um, after this downturn, and that's the way we do it. So people who would say that, um, that the, the job of the treasurer is to protect the pension plan and to help it grow and thrive, that might, there may be some tension there with investing in, in small businesses and other businesses that might be a little bit more risky, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, what, what do you say to that tension? I would say that, first of all, look at the facts and the pension fund we have now. The current treasurer hasn't protected it. That's why we've lost $3 billion. And I can show you those numbers and explain how we get to it. So we're, we haven't protected it. And in a, in a world where bond yields are gonna be much lower than they've been traditionally, pension funds totally out of whack. We need to find new asset classes to invest in if we're going to deliver on the assumed rate of return that this treasurer has signed off on, which is 7%. So we need to find a diverse set of assets to invest in across a broad set of asset classes, and we need to manage risk. Right now, with $11 billion, almost um, more than, I think, 12% of the pension fund underneath the Elfall Wolf's mattress, we're not managing risk and we're not protecting the pension fund. We're not generating value for state employees. So you mentioned the $3 billion a couple of times. So in, in ways that us lay people can understand, sure. talk us through that. Sure. If we had the amount in equities that the investment policy says the treasurer signed off on, we would be $3 billion richer because that money would have been invested in equities from 2017 and the markets have gone up to record highs. So it, we have $3 billion that we don't have. It's not about having a crystal ball. You know, he's claiming that he doesn't have a crystal ball. He's the one deviating from our policy and treating this like his hedge fund, buying and selling on the market downturns. This is not the job of a state treasurer to play the markets like their own personal fund. Long-term investment strategy, consistent. And we deviated from that, and that's where we've lost $3 billion. So when he says, and Ned mentioned his kind of dismissive remarks uh, uh, when we spoke with him, he said, and I'll, I'll, I wrote it down when he said it, you've never managed money or managed people. And I want to talk about the first part of that, mm -hmm. the managed money part. Um, mm -hmm. So when he says you've never managed money, what's your response to that? I'm an economist who understands the way markets work, which is what he lacks. And he doesn't have a chief investment officer with real experience managing money. The biggest hire that a state treasurer makes is not themselves being an elected politician. It's hiring a permanent chief investment officer to make those decisions. They all follow well decided that he could make those. He had all the answers. And that kind of elitist attitude has lost us a lot of money. So no, it's, it's the state treasurer manages our pension fund, our health care plan, our infrastructure. You're not a money manager. You hire the chief investment officer to do that job and you listen to her or him. That's what he's missed in this whole thing. And I think that's really responsible for a lot of the mistakes he's made across healthcare as well, where he hasn't listened to stakeholders. So in terms of when it comes to managing the office, that's the first hire I'll make. And that person will have the experience. I'm proud of my record. You know, I understand the way the economy works. I got a PhD. I'm an economist. I understand the way markets and healthcare and infrastructure work. I've worked on these things at the federal and state level. I have independent research published that's been cited by sources all over the world. I wrote a book on how business could be a smarter investor. I don't need to necessarily defend this against Dale Falwell after his performance, but I can put up my credentials with his or anyone else in state government. So you talked about the healthcare plan being a mess. Elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. So Dale Falwell introduced something called the clear pricing plan. The first mistake was, well, we all like transparency and pricing. He doesn't support expanding Medicaid. I hope you had a chance to ask him about that during the interview. Every time we're put side to side, he ducks the question, which I think 
is not um, appropriate for a leader in state government. The treasurer is the largest payer of healthcare in North Carolina through the state health plan. Medicaid and the state health plan are big sources of revenue for our hospitals, the ones that are protecting us during coronavirus. If you don't have an opinion on Medicaid or don't have an answer on that, you're advocating your responsibility. So I've supported the expansion of Medicaid since the very beginning in 2010, even when it was less popular. I support it now with 38 states and the District of Columbia also expanded it. And I support it for North Carolina going forward because I think it'll improve our health care. Dale Falwell didn't want to support that, didn't want to be on the record. So he started off trying to jam their pricing plan through. None of our hospitals, or very few, eventually ended up signing up. We have 126 hospitals in the state and four signed up. That means if you're a state employee, where's your cancer hospital? Where is your children's hospital? So we had to sign at the last second, capitulate, and then sign a whole other deal with our state hospitals that basically pays them the same he was paying last year. So we just, we're spending more money now. The, the, the providers that signed the clear pricing plan all got a paid bump. And with all the hospitals, which is the majority of healthcare in North Carolina, he signed the same deals last year. But he's claiming that hundreds of thousands of providers have signed up. Ask a state employee if they can go to the hospital under the clear pricing plan. Unless you happen to be lucky enough to live and you're one of those four rare hospitals in North Carolina, the answer is no. So clear pricing plan was a failure and will continue to be a failure because the network wasn't adequate for our state employees. That's just an application responsibility and a failure that we have to fix when I'm state treasurer. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Did you see that report that uh, British Petroleum is uh, trying to convert its uh, investments into more into uh, clean energy, thinking that that's the future? And I know you've talked a little bit about the state should be looking the same way in terms of the future of investments is maybe not just in utility stock and that kind of thing, but in getting a hold of this new wave of energy and, and protecting against climate change. What do you think about that? I mean, I follow the news very closely on BP and I follow that company for a long time, dating back to their Beyond Petroleum campaign. It comes down to sort of managing risk, not politics. The CFTC, which is one of the top financial regulators in the country, had a, a panel of 34 experts appointed by President Trump's appointees, and they came out with a 34 to 0 recommendation two weeks ago that climate change is a systemic risk to the financial system. No politics, no ideology, climate change will affect us. Dale Falwell, as you know, in his response to numerous questionnaires, said he doesn't believe in climate change. So we have a person managing our money who doesn't believe in one of the biggest risks actually even existing. We're going to need to manage against climate change. I don't want my folks' money or other people who are state employees having their money invested in stranded assets or companies that are facing penalties and fines because of environmental misbehavior. We must incorporate climate change risks into our assets and liabilities in our calculations. We don't necessarily have to divest from particular sectors. What we need to do is manage our risks. BP is a great example. It's a company that's obviously heavily involved in a lot of the utility sectors, but it also has one of the biggest renewable portfolios. We could be shareholders in companies like this and many others and be pushing for innovation. When you have $100 billion in assets, you got 100 billion votes on the way the economy works and who it works for, and we ought to use it. And uh, I think being blind to the risks of climate change or any other risk, it's, uh, it's not consistent with fiduciary responsibility of the state treasurer. What about the uh, treasurer's comment about your lack of experience in managing people? It is a pretty big office and it's a pretty complex level of work. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of expertise do you have in, in managing people? Yeah, well, I mean, I put my record up of, you know, for 15 years, I've taught business students and MBA students how to go out and manage. I've written articles and trained and worked with companies all across the globe on management. And I would, again, hire a great chief of staff to help us manage the office. That's what people do in this situation. It's a team effort. You can't have all the answers. Treasurer Falwell can't simultaneously be the chief investment officer and the manager in chief and getting on the front page of the paper all the time. He's got to be spending some more time on some or the other. I have a guess on that. When it comes to managing people, I mean, look at his performance in the unemployment office where he was supposedly managing people. We have the worst unemployment system in, North in the country, providing the weakest of benefits at the worst possible time. If that's a record of management, I'll put mine up any day of the week. I need to hire a team to come around with me on these different issues. No one person has all the answers. An elitist attitude would say you can go in and solve everything. That's not what this job is about. This job is about managing lots of different functions and getting the best people to work for you. If you look at Dale Falwell's record, I think you'll see attrition from a lot of key people across the aisle, not just D's or R's, but everybody from his office. Why don't people want to work in that office? Why are they leaving? I don't think that's a testament to a management side. Otherwise, you'd have a full-time CIO. <laughs> Have you heard from people inside the office? <laughs> so uh, you know, we, we do get a lot of people reaching out. I, um, you know, some of it's anonymous and some folks, um, you know, it's on social media, but I, I, mean, I think you should follow up folks. I think it'd be really interesting to hear their view of what's going on inside the office. I mean, there's been lots of different things in the office and 
Look, I know this is a under the radar job, um, but it is, I think, the most important job no one's ever heard of in North Carolina. It's hard to cover all the machinations, but there's, a, there's been a lot of big stories in that office over the past three years that I think could, do, could see more coverage. I know that we're gonna have to rebuild the team though. And, and again, it's, it's not rocket science. None of this is very abstract. You know, I think Dale Falwell thinks he has the answers. It, you can just go back to the investment policy. Let's align our investments with our Ashley policy. Let's hire a chief investment officer who will follow that. With healthcare, let's support expanding Medicaid. I think that will happen in 2021. Let's sit down with the hospitals and instead of their pricing plan, let's hold them accountable for healthcare outcomes and price, a big, big missing part of a clear pricing plan. So many of our hospitals in North Carolina already get paid that way. Why don't our state employees deserve the same kind of payment scheme? So these are things we have done in North Carolina and we can do with state health plan. We just had better energetic and innovative leadership. And I think that's what I'll bring. You think it was a mistake to bring the state health plan under the treasurer? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, it is rare. Um, and the context of the time wasn't one that I was involved in. I think the state treasurer though, because of the management of the pension could ideally have good visibility in healthcare. When you think about it, when you're, when you're managing people's retirement, you're also thinking about not just their wealth, but their health later in life. And when you have the state health plan, you can pair those things together if you're smart. There hasn't been a lot of collaboration as far as I can see between what's going on in the state health plan and the pension fund. I think it's a missed opportunity. It certainly makes this job though, Ned, probably one of the biggest jobs in state government because I'm not aware of any other state where they have both of them with a sole trustee. So it definitely requires someone who has the temperament and the experience to go do the job. Um, I would say, if you, if you look at this, I mean, talk to people in the healthcare industry about working with Treasurer Falwell's office and the attitude that's, that, that comes out of there. I think that would be another interesting thing to look at. My solutions for healthcare are all gonna require me to work together with health systems across all 100 counties. You can't get things done in the era of COVID without that. And you have to have a certain approach and it can't be my way or the highway every time, particularly in a state that is more purple than blue or red. I just don't see that. I mean, when the endorsements came in 2016, a lot of folks lauded a nonpartisan approach that Treasurer Falwell would take in this office. I haven't really seen that. And I'll give you another example. What about healthcare for state employees who have transgender kids? That was revoked under Treasurer Falwell. That sounds like a very political decision, given that so many other companies in North Carolina cover that healthcare. These are things that the treasurer shouldn't be uh, involved in changing. I would restore it. Um, the treasurer job isn't about being on the front page of the paper. In fact, if I'm on the front page of the paper, I've done something terribly wrong. Though I know you guys are more in that business, so maybe you know, we'll have the conversation another time. But the treasurer should be an under-the-radar post that's less political. I don't think it has been in the treasurer. Well, this, the treasurer is very critical of fees that are paid to uh, you know mm -hmm. consultants and managers of these funds. And he vowed to eliminate a lot of the fees, and he did. Mm -hmm. uh, has that worked out? Is that a good idea? Oh, we should, we should always try and reduce fees in our pension fund, but we can't miss the bigger picture. He claims to have um, removed three hundred million dollars in fees. I've never seen the numbers. No one's ever challenged them on it. I've never seen the breakdown on that. But even if he saved. $300 million. We're talking about $100 billion here. So for a family of four where you spend $65,000 a year, that's like saving 50 bucks in a year. That's impressive, but it's not a lot of money when it comes to the state pension fund. And he's also lost $3 billion at the same time. That's why I say this is like saying you save money because you didn't change your oil for three years in your car. You're going to replace your engine soon and it's going to cost you. And so while it might make sense, and this is where a politician would approach it very differently than me, Trying to fulfill a campaign promise, get reelected, build a political portfolio, those fees sound really large. But these cost us so much money that someone else is going to have to clean up and figure out a way to get back to the state of North Carolina. And time is the one thing you can't get back when you're a long term investor. What did you learn at the White House that's relevant to your experience in the state? When we came back from the Great Recession, uh, one of the biggest holes in our recovery was state and local funding. States like North Carolina cut state budgets and local budgets. I watched with horror from the White House because I understood that one out of 12 people work for state and local government. We're about to make that mistake again. You know, I wish the Treasurer Falwell and some of our other elected leaders would be a little bit more direct with Senator Tillis, Senator Burr, other people who have power up there. Um, we need state and local funding to help North Carolina government, our state government, and our municipal governments who have huge coronavirus related holes that have nothing to do with the way they mismanage their money, it has everything to do with a pandemic that wasn't managed well at the national level. And I worry that if we don't get that funding, we'll make the same mistake again. So that's one thing that I learned. Do not make that mistake again. Two is the importance of investing in small businesses that get hit the hardest. I mean, you guys know, you covered this in Charlotte Observer, the Durham Herald Sun, and the News Observer. The PPP program was a failure. I mean, we were giving money to Shake Shack and professional sports franchises, and there were businesses in North Carolina that didn't have the relationships with banks and weren't first in line. If we leave behind small business, particularly our restaurants and retail, 
some of those businesses are never going to come back. And those are the kind of main street businesses that employ a large proportion of North Carolina. So those are two things that I'll take from my experience. The other is be humble. Any expertise you think you have doesn't mean you have all the answers. Listen to people who have expertise and are smarter than you. I think one of the challenges we're seeing in government is getting so politicized from the CDC on down that we have politicians making decisions that experts should be making. All right. Do you uh, have any uh, closing comment that you'd like to share with viewers in terms of... Uh... Sure. Well, first of all, I mean, thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is a race where a lot of people are going to go to the ballot and they're going to look at two names and not know much about them. And I really believe that the role of our media in North Carolina is to try to provide people information on those races. I think your endorsements in 2016 individually were very influential in the race. And I think you have an opportunity to tell people, you know, who you think is best for the job. And I appreciate it being considered. I think that the things we need to do to fix the, fix the Department of State Treasurer's Office are straightforward and they require a team. And I think I have the right background. I think that's why, you know, for someone who's a first timer in state politics, uh, this race is so competitive. Unlike a lot of council state races often are. I also think that giving someone with a new perspective is really important in Raleigh. It's a lot of the same good old boys network that, that runs things. And you don't have a lot of thinking that is contrarian or different. That's scary for a lot of folks in Raleigh, but I think it's gonna benefit the people who the government ultimately serves. 